Well, what a what a daunting list this is. As we look at the the names on here and and think of the situations behind these names and, and the, the emotional trauma, the physical trauma, and, and just the the anxiety and the worry and, and all those things that come along with with these life issues that have been mentioned tonight. And um, God, I know that you're more than sufficient for every need that we have. But sometimes it's hard for us to see that in, in, in the midst of the battle. I pray that you would help the people on this list uh, find comfort in their in their walk with you, uh, that you would bring people around them to offer uh, words of encouragement, that you would remind them that you've not abandoned them, but you promised never to leave us or forsake us. And I pray that you would just walk with these people and, and, and their loved ones in a special way during these hard days and I ask it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Okay, we've been looking uh, for the past you know, four or five times we've met at the question, what does God want us to know? And and you remember that I did that because that's the, the topic that I use for the youth camp in Pere Peru. And so I'm just, uh, I began by trying out some of the material on you. And then since we didn't finish the whole study, I decided to go ahead and just finish the study with you before we go to, to our next thing in, in, our, in our Bible study series. And we talked so far about what God wants us to know about his existence, that there, there, there are logical reasons to believe that, that there is a God, and that there's a God who loves us and cares about us, and, and we know him because he has chosen to make himself known to us. He has, he's revealed himself to us. And then we looked at, at the nature of God, what God is like, uh, his characteristics and, and, and his basic nature. And then we approached the question, what does God want us to know about the Bible? Because the Bible is one of the tools that God uses to reveal himself to us. So we looked at, at, at the Bible, uh, why we believe it's inspired, the, the case for inspiration, how the Bible is organized, how to study the Bible. Then we talk about what God wants us to know about Jesus. He's the, the main character of the Bible. Uh, everything points to him. And so we talked about you know, him being fully God and fully man, fully divine and fully human. And then we talked about last week what God wants to know about, about ourselves and that, that we're made by God, we're made like God, and we've also sinned against God. And, and I said last week, when we ended our session last week, that that the you know looking at the at the uh, story of Adam and Eve, uh, the the whole rest of the Bible after they're they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they lost that special relationship with God, the whole rest of the Bible is the story of how God of God's plan to restore that relationship, and we're going to talk tonight about specifically what God wants us to know about having that relationship restored about about salvation, and we're going to do it by looking at what I think is one of the great paragraphs in the Bible is Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10. And uh, I, got, I got to looking back at this today and, and I realized that, that in 2020, and, and I think that's the year we first began doing these Zoom Bible studies. We met in person up until 220. And, and I think the first study we did on Zoom was a study of Ephesians. I think we went through the book, you know, verse by verse over, over a, a four or five month period. I want to go back and look at verses two through uh, one through ten of chapter two tonight, and then also look at, at a, a, a an event in Paul's life in Acts chapter sixteen as an illustration of what the Bible teaches in Ephesians two one through ten. So someone has said that that this paragraph is the best summary of the gospel to be found in the New Testament, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, everything that we need to know about salvation really is packed into this paragraph. Now, it's interesting that Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, it, in the Greek, is one long rambling sentence. Uh, all, all these verses that are broken up in the English Bibles into a number of sentences in, in the Greek New Testament are, are one long sentence by the Apostle Paul. And when you, when you read a, a sentence that complex and that long, to, to really understand it, you have to pick out what the main verb is, uh, what the main subject is, who is who is the actor, and what is the object, who is being acted upon. Now, in this paragraph, just, uh, just, uh, just to start, if you look at verse 5, verse 5 contains the main verb of the paragraph. And, and, and the main verb is, uh, I'm trying to find the, the word there, 
made us alive. That's that's the main verb. Made us alive. Or made alive. Um, now that's that's the action word. Now who is doing the action? The the subject is God. God is the one who made us alive. Uh, who is the object? The object is us. Uh, we are the ones who've been made alive. But this this paragraph tells us how God has taken us from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's that's the subject of this paragraph. So what I want to do, I know it's, it's, it's a long paragraph. I want to, I think we need to read the whole thing at one time. So if, if you have your Bible before you there, look at Ephesians chapter chapter two. Now I'm going to read all, all the verses, verses one through 10, and follow along in, in your Bible as I read. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. You may have a, a different version, uh, but you can follow along and, and get the thought as, as I read. So, so look, at, look at what it says, Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And, and by the way, let me just stop there just a minute. I won't stop every verse. But in, in the Bible, there, there are three kinds of death. There, there's spiritual death. And that's what this paragraph is talking about right now, spiritual death where we're separated from God. There's physical death where our bodies actually die. We know that we all die at some point in time physically. And there's also what's called the eternal death, which is separation from God for all eternity because we've not come to, to restore our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. This paragraph is talking about spiritual death. You, you were spiritually dead, he said, in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that, in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as the result of works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, not for uh, uh, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, in that in that sentence, there are two phrases that, that to me, everything hangs on. The first phrase is, and you, in verse one. And the second phrase is, but God, in verse four. Uh, and you, here's your condition. You were dead in your trespasses, uh, you you were guilty. You had no way out. Uh, there was no excuse. Uh, you were stuck in this place. But God, in his mercy, in his grace, in his love, has taken action to deal with that problem in our lives. And, and in, in this paragraph, four words are used that, are, that describe the, the salvation process. And there are four of the great words of the New Testament. There's the word saved. There's the word grace. There's the word faith. And there's the word works. Uh, saved is the primary word used in the New Testament to describe the state of being made right with God, being reconciled with God. That word is used about 90 times in the New Testament. The word grace describes God's part in the salvation process. The word faith describes our part in the salvation process. And the word works result, describes the results of the salvation process. Now, so we're going to look at all four of those words tonight just a little bit. But I want to do it with a, another biblical event in the background of our, of our conversation. In Acts chapter 16, there, there's one of the great stories in the New Testament. And I know you You've heard the story many times. You've read the story. Uh, Paul and Silas were uh, in Philippi, uh, the nation there in, in kind of the northern part of Greece. 
and they were sharing the gospel. Uh, they, they got in trouble with the authorities in town. They were arrested. They were taken before the, the judgment seat there. They were beaten with rods and they were cast in prison. Uh, they, were, they were in prison late at night. Uh, they were singing praises to God, even, even late at night, even in their, their tough condition. And the jailer uh, in, in the jail there uh, took his job very seriously. Uh, he placed them in, in chains. He locked them up. And he knew that if they got free, he would be in jeopardy. And there was an earthquake that night. And all the chains of the prisoners fell off. And, and all the doors were open. And, and the jailer took out his sword to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had been set free. And, and just before he was to kill himself, Paul and Silas yelled out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now, I want to pick up the story in Acts chapter 16 and just read verses 29 through 34 to, to tell you what happened after that event took place. And, and here, here's, here's what happened. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 30, 31. And, and, and the jailer asked him in verse 30, uh, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And here's what Paul and Silas said. They said, believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very night, that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Now, from those two Bible passages, Acts chapter 16 and Ephesians chapter 2, I want to share with you just three basic statements about salvation tonight, about this salvation process. And, and the first statement is this. We, we are saved by grace. Now, that is, salvation is, is the result of what God has done. It's the result of, of God's grace. Uh, it's, it's interesting, in, in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, uh, when the jailer found out that Paul and Silas and the prisoners were still there, uh, he asked a question, but, but he really asked the wrong question. Uh, the question he asked us, what must, was, what, what must I do to be saved? And, and that really wasn't the right question. The more appropriate question, the more correct question would be, uh, how can I be saved? But, but in his defense, uh, probably in his mind, he wasn't asking a, a theological question. He was asking an intensely personal question. He was saying, what can I do to have in my life what I see you guys have in, in your life? Uh, but, but his question is really a common mistake that people make when it comes to the salvation process. Uh, they, they think that you know, somehow there's something that we have to do uh, to, to merit or to earn or to gain or to get our salvation. Uh, just, just tell me what to do. Uh, how many church services do I have to go to? How much do I have to pray? How much do I have to read my Bible? How much do I have to, to, to give? How much do I have to help people? What, what bad habits do I need to, to get rid of in order to be accepted by God? And, and, and it's just something in us that, that makes us think that salvation is something that we can achieve or we can earn for ourselves. And many, many people um, have tried that uh, and are still trying today. Um, and and, and, and they, they always come up short. You, you never can do enough to earn, earn your salvation. One of my, my favorite stories from church history is, is about Martin Luther. Um, you know, Martin Luther... Uh, desperately wanted to be worthy of, of God's of God's love for him, of, of God's grace and God's salvation. And he wanted to be accepted by God. And early in his life, Luther did everything he could possibly do to earn salvation. He went so far as to imprison himself, to lock himself up. Uh, he went without food and water for days. He walked around on his hands and knees trying to be, you know, punish his body and be worthy of salvation. And in the end, after, after all that he tried to do, he discovered he could never do enough to merit salvation. And, and he adopted the slogan, sola gratia, uh, solely of grace or solely by grace. Salvation comes to us only by the grace of God. Now, in Ephesians chapter two, the scripture makes that, that quite clear. 
Um, salvation is not based on what we do. It's based on what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I know we, we all hear that concept and we talk about it, but, but I think a lot of times we tend to live our lives as if, as if that's not true. Uh, I've got to do more. I've got to be more. I've got to be better so, to make sure that God still loves me and God still accepts me. But that, that's not where salvation begins. Salvation begins with God's grace. Look, look back again at Ephesians 2 at verses 4 through 7. Uh, it's such a, such a, a great statement there. Uh, but God being rich in mercy. Notice the words here, mercy and, and love and grace and kindness. Uh, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace Grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the word grace reminds us that salvation is the work of God on our behalf at the expense of Christ. Uh, that's why we, we say salvation is by grace. It all begins with God. But that's just, that's just part of it, though. Uh, this passage doesn't stop there. Salvation is by grace, but salvation is through faith. That is, salvation, which is the work of God, must be received by us. Uh, that is our part in, in the salvation process. While, while grace describes what God has done, faith describes what we are to do. Now, the, the jailer in Philippi, uh, you know, even though he asked Paul and Silas the wrong question, uh, Paul and Silas gave him the right answer. In response to his question, what must I do to be saved? Uh, in, in effect, they said, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you can't do anything. What you, All you can do is just believe in Jesus. And, and, and the precise words in Acts 16.31 is, believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. It's important to understand the word believe in Acts chapter 16 and the word faith in Ephesians chapter 2 are, are basically the same word. They're same, from the same word family. Uh, believe is the verb form of the word. Faith is the noun form of the word. But, it, but it's the same thing. The only, only difference is, is the verb and, and the noun. Now, now, believing or having faith is our part in, in the salvation process. Now, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I think there, there are, in the biblical sense, there are two dimensions to, to saving faith or saving belief. Uh, first, there's the, the intellectual dimension. Uh, that, that is accepting with our minds the, the, the gospel, the facts of the gospel, that, that God became flesh in Christ in the virgin birth, that Christ lived a sinless life, that he, he died a sacrificial death on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised again the third day. Uh, believe or having faith means to accept intellectually the reality of the historical facts of the gospel. But, but that by itself is not enough. Uh, like James says in James, I think it's chapter two, even the demons believe. Uh, there's the intellectual side, but there's also the, the emotional dimension of belief. And, and this, this is where you make a, a conscious, personal commitment to invite Jesus into our lives, to place our lives in his hands, to, to trust him and only him for our salvation, and to allow him to be the Lord of our, our lives. Um, I, I think that to have saving faith or belief um, in, the, in the emotional realm, it really means it's, it's four, four things that are involved in that, four, four steps. We, 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 we recognize and we realize that, that we're spiritually dead. That, that we have a need, as we, as we saw last week in our study of who, of who we are. Uh, we admit that we're powerless on our own to do anything about that need. No, no matter how hard we try, we can't, we can't uh, undo our sin nature. We can't, we can't earn our own salvation. We can't build a, a, the salvation ship for ourselves. Uh, then, then we acknowledge that the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God's answer to our sin problem. 
one of my favorite verses is, is 1 Peter 3, 18, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it, but it says, Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, be put to death in the flesh and made alive in, in the spirit. So, so we, 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 we recognize our, our sin problem. Uh, we admit that we can't solve that problem on our own. We acknowledge that Jesus is God's answer to that. And then the, the fourth thing on this emotional dimension of, 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 of uh, faith is that we, we invite Jesus uh, into our lives to, to forgive our sin, to restore that broken relationship with God, and, and be the Lord of our lives. So that, that's what it means when I say we're saved by grace, but we're saved through faith. Uh, we put our faith in, in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the second thing. And the third thing that this, this text teaches that I think is really important is that salvation results in good works. Um, that, that is, while salvation is not the result of good works, good works is always the result of salvation. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, go back to the example of the Philippian jailer for a moment. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we know that he really believed in, in Jesus? Um, we, we know because of his actions. Look, look at what he did in, in that story. Instead of keeping Paul and Silas locked up in his cell, he brought them into his home. He treated their wounds. He, he gave them food. He was baptized as, as an outward expression of his, of his inward belief. And then he led his entire household. Uh, his family and his servants to, to faith in Christ as well. And what I want you to see is that the, the result of salvation is a changed life. Uh, the scripture says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature. The old things have passed away and, and the new have come. Now, sometimes it happens really quickly in people's lives. Sometimes it's a long, difficult process. God is remaking us constantly to the image of Christ. But, but if you can look back in your life, and see that God has taken you from point A to point B, that you've made progress in your spiritual life, that you're becoming more like Christ in the journey. Uh, that is the evidence of salvation. That, that's the, the good works, that's the result of salvation. Also, the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, where it talks about you know, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and meekness and gentleness and self-control and all those things. That, that's, that's evidence that, that, that God is, is working in us and making us more into the image of Jesus Christ. So, so while we're saved by grace and through faith, the result of that is, is good works. And I've told you before, uh, and there are just some, some statements I've heard in my life over the years that just stuck my mind. And this is one of them that comes from Curtis Vaughn, who was my, one of my uh, teachers in seminary. He was a, a, a Greek and New Testament scholar, wrote some great books. I've, I've used this stuff a lot. But he always liked to say uh, that, that good works is the fruit of salvation, but not the root of salvation. Uh, it's, 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 it, it, it doesn't, it, good works don't produce salvation. Salvation produces good works. That, that's the, the point there. And, and it, it's, as I was reading Ephesians 2 today, I was reminded again that there, there are some decisions in life that, that are, uh, so important that we just cannot afford to get them wrong. Uh, we can be wrong about a lot of stuff. You know, there are you know, politics and finances and you know, all sport, all kinds of stuff we can be wrong about. But there are some things in life that are, that are too important to not get right. Um, and, and one of those things is the nature of salvation. Because if, if we miss this, if, if we miss out on this, Really, it doesn't matter what else we get right. We've really missed the, the main purpose of life. So it's just important that, that believers understand and, and hear clearly that, that by grace is God's part in the salvation process, through faith is our part in the process, and for good works is the result of the process. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 say it so well. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. Okay, now, the next question we will get to in the next couple of weeks is once once we are saved, once once we make that faith commitment to 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 God through Christ, um, what should our lives look like? How does God want us to live? And, and I want to, in the next few weeks, call your attention to a couple of Bible verses that really just kind of in bullet point fashion give us a picture of what the life of a Christian should look like on a daily basis. And we'll spend a couple of weeks looking at that before we go to a new subject uh, a few weeks from now. Okay, observations from you. Observations or insights you see in that, anything. I know that stuff you've heard most of you all your lives. Uh, you, you, you could quote that in your sleep probably, but it's important for us to, to keep it in mind, to, to uh, rethink it, and, and to uh, not forget the basics of salvation. That's, that's just, just basic stuff that we need to keep in our minds. Any observations or insight you want to share before we conclude tonight? So faith is our response by believing in Jesus. I've been trying to get this in, you know, straight in my head for years, but um, we still have to have the call of God on our lives in order to believe in Him. Yeah, to exercise but, that faith. Yeah, but 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 it, and I, my, I like to say, sal- grace is the favor and faith is the gift. Because yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So, I, just, I just like to say, grace is God's part. He, he extends to everyone. Faith is our part to receive. But, I, you know, there's it's, it's such a debate about uh-huh. uh, about about you know, election and call. But, but you know, the scriptures tells us it's not God's will that any should perish. So that right. says that says to me that God gives everyone the opportunity to respond. Those who do respond become God's elect. God's elect mm-hmm. are those who respond. But but I, I, I can't I can't. Uh, I cannot uh, come to the point of thinking there are some people who have no opportunity to respond because to me then that makes God arbitrary, you know, and, and, and makes people, you know, makes salvation uh, 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 very exclusive. And, and, and I understand the, 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 uh, uh, the conflict between the sovereignty of God and the freedom of, of us, and we're not going to resolve that. God is sovereign. And, and God, God does what God's going to do, and we are free to make our choices. Uh, yeah, I had a pastor in Hamilton City. He said, "Sovereignty of God and you know the will of man run parallel to each other, and they can only be connected by the cross of Jesus Christ." Yeah, I, I, I like that. Yeah, I remember. I like, I like yeah. to say that salvation is all of God, all by God, and all for God and His glory. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, without Jesus' sacrifice, we wouldn't have, you know, salvation right. at all. That's right. That's right. It's, 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 yeah, it, it's God's work. It's not our work. It's, God, it's God's work. Yeah. I, I like, uh, W.A. Crystal he had, had an illustration that I forgot where I read it in his works, but he, he described the gates of heaven. He said, you, you look at the gates of heaven from, from this side. You know, and it, again, this is this is just just it's it's a it's a uh, metaphor, but, but but this side it reads whosoever will may come. You know, so uh, you walk through it, and look back, it says God's elect. You know, as I I kind of like that. You know, everybody can come, but it's God's elect who, who do come. You know, and uh, uh, but but you know, I mean, it's God's grace, our faith, and then the result of that is is a, a transformed life. That's the result of that. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks, Fancy. Uh, anything else you may want to share? Well, it's good to see everyone tonight, uh, and I hope, hope you had a good week. And we'll we'll plan next week to uh, – we're going to spend two more weeks on, on this, and then we'll – I'm not sure quite where we're going to go next. I, we talked about doing the Matter of Prophets, which I'm still thinking about that. But I'm also thinking about maybe another letter, like uh, maybe First John, which we – we did First John 15 years ago, I think. We first wrote this Bible study. I think that's the, one of the first things we did. But I, uh, the reason I'm thinking of First John is we're doing that again in a small group we're in on Monday nights right now, uh, the church we attend. And, and I just I just uh, was awakened again to how great that little letter is. It's a, it's a great letter. And and um, you know, most of you weren't, weren't around in, in the group 15 years ago, whatever it was we started this thing. And, and uh, 
Um, so uh, we may go back there, but we'll, we'll do well those two in the weeks ahead. So, okay, anything else tonight? Thanks, good Larry. to see everybody. Y'all, y'all have a good week, and and uh, we'll we we'll, we'll we'll see you all next week. Okay. Thank right. you. Thanks. Thanks. Right, bye. bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.